There's something you might not know about me. Okay. You guys know I play golf, but you might not know that I used to play baseball. Okay. Yeah. Baseball was like my sport. Okay. I wasn't a soccer player. I wasn't a football player. I was a baseball player. And I played all the way up until when I was about 13 years old. Then I made the transition over to golf, and it's been, been good ever since. <laughs> Booing. It's great. Glad you don't like my life choices. But, um, but yeah, I played baseball, and I was the kind of kid, let's just be honest, I did not practice very much, okay? I didn't practice very much. That didn't mean I was, like, the worst kid on the team. I actually was, was pretty good on most teams I was at, like, I'd bat third or fourth. I'd play first base. I was a pitcher. I did all that kind of stuff. I was a little bit bigger than some of the kids on the team. So I did not have to practice. That was until I made the all-star team. And when I was on the all-star team, I was the worst player on the team. Okay. So I had to practice. It was one year. I remember the summer. It was a hard summer for me because I was an 11-year-old playing on the 12-year-old all-star team. And I was the worst player on the team. Okay. Um, I was used to playing pitcher. I was used to playing first base. Sometimes I played catcher. But this season, I was, um, I was playing a lot of right field, okay? Yeah. I was playing a lot of second base, if you know what I'm talking about. You know second base? It's where they put you if you're not as good, okay? Right field, that's where not that many people hit the ball, okay? But what I'll never forget about that summer was the coach that I had was super, super mean. So mean. Like, so mean, he'd try to make all of his players cry. He would yell at you. He would scream at you. If you didn't catch a, a ground ball, he'd make you run. He'd make you sweat. He was just a mean guy, okay? Um, but the truth is, actually, after being on his team for a while, I realized he actually wasn't that mean. He just was super strict. And you know what this coach did, actually, is uh, he made everybody on his team a lot better. He was the coach who, every year, won every tournament that they were in. He was the coach that had the best team every year. And I realized why. It was because he forced me to step up, even if it was by yelling at me and doing all that kind of stuff. I remember uh, we did not touch a bat for the first like month of practice. We didn't hit at all. And everyone complained. said, why aren't we, why aren't we hitting the ball? Don't we want to hit? And then he said, you are going to hit so much in the second month that your hands are going to bleed you're going to be hitting so much. That's all you're going to do. And it's going to be so much hitting. And I'm going to make you so good at hitting. And it was just like so intense, right? But the thing is, it really did make me a better player. And I never really played better than I did that one little season of All-Stars because I had a coach that was really mean. And like I said before, I don't think he was really mean. I think he was trying to get the best out of his players. And I think that's what we're going to run into today in a text that's different than what we've studied all year. All year we've been studying the gospel of John, where John the apostle has been telling us the story of Jesus, okay? We're going in a totally different kind of book, and what we're going to study is the last words from a coach to an athlete, so to speak. The last words from a guy named Paul to someone that he was mentoring to take his place named Timothy. And the main goal of this book that we're going to look at over the next two weeks is that Paul is telling Timothy to step up. Tell him to step up. You're going to have more responsibility. You're going to get older. You're going to have more things that God wants you to do. And you need to step up to the challenge. And I think the reason we want to study this tonight is because that's what's happening right now. You're going to move from seventh grade, some of you, to be eighth graders. Okay? You're going to be the oldest. You're going to be the smartest. See the air quotes? Uh, smartest, right? You're going to be the biggest. You're going to be the top dogs. Okay? You need to step up. Eighth graders, you're going to be the worst, the smallest. The runts, the freshmen, some translations call it fresh meat, okay? Uh, you're going to be fresh meat. But here's the thing, eighth graders, you're going to be in high school. You're going to be in high school. So even that is going to be reason for you to step up. So I want us to grab our Bibles and look at this book. Let's check out the book of 2 Timothy. That's the book we've been talking about this whole time. 2 Timothy. We're going to see what Paul says to Timothy, because Timothy's about to take on something big. Actually, something bigger than just going into high school. But I think we're going to learn a lot about what God calls Christians to do as they continue to step up to do more things. What we learn here is that Paul is calling Timothy to be a pastor over a church in a big area. Okay? This is a big area. We think that Timothy is becoming a pastor over an area called Ephesus, the city of Ephesus. And we learn about that in 1 Timothy and also in 2 Timothy. And what we're going to see is he is a man who is a little bit scared. 
He's a little bit timid. And we kind of read between the lines a little bit to find that out. But we think that Paul says he needs to be more bold because he's got a big job ahead of him. He needs to be courageous. And we're going to look at here in 2 Timothy chapter 2, the first thing that we see in this text actually comes before the text that we're going to start at. But I want you to look at chapter 2, verse 1. He says, you then, my child. He's not actually his physical child, but he's a person that he's uh, mentored for a while. He says, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. That word be strengthened is not um, so passive as it seems here. It seems like, oh, you should get strength from somewhere else. No, the command here is be strong. Be strong. Be bold. Act like a man. That's what Paul's telling Timothy to do here. Be strong. By what? The grace that's in Christ Jesus. And he has a job for him to do. He says, and what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust to faithful men also who will be able to teach others also. So that, that's the basis for the text we're going to look at because that's what Timothy's job is. The next verses that we're going to look at give us three different pictures. Paul paints the picture, three different pictures, three different ways that tell us that we need to take our job as Christians seriously, especially as we keep moving up, especially as God gives you more responsibilities. Check it out. Verse three. This is our text we're going to look at tonight. It says, share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. You see that idea of a soldier. That's the first picture he's going to paint. Verse four talks about more. He says, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Okay? Imagine becoming a soldier. Think about it. What would that be like if tomorrow you were going to be sent off to boot camp? What would that be like? If you were a Marine, Okay, you had to go through boot camp. You had to go through some hard things. Imagine, like seriously, put yourself in the shoes of someone who did that. Right, in America, obviously, not everyone has to serve in the military. But in some countries, every person serves in the military. Countries like um, Israel, countries like South Korea, you have to serve. Everyone has to serve. Imagine if you had to serve. And it was the day before you went to boot camp. That'd be a frightening day. That'd be a scary day. Which is why Paul says to Timothy, you need to be strong. Be strong. God's got work for you to do. Share in suffering as a good soldier. Imagine if you were a soldier and you said, hey, I'm gonna join this army, but um, if I get any boo-boos, if I get any uh, little cuts, I, I just have to, I have to quit, okay? I just can't I, can't, I can't deal with the emotional stress of being in a war. What, what, what do you think the people who are gonna bring you in the army, what do you think the Marines are gonna say about that? Uh, you should probably not be here, right? Uh, because that's kind of what this is. Even if we're not in a war right now, we're preparing for a war. That's the truth of joining any army. Imagine that's you. Imagine you're about to enter a war. That's what Paul says to Timothy. He says, also, don't get entangled. Don't get mixed up in civilian pursuits. If you're going to be a soldier, you've got a job to do. It's called being a soldier. Your job is not to run a business. Your job is not to do stuff at home. Your job is to be a soldier. That's your role. Your focus needs to be in the right place. Verse five, he gives another illustration. So he says, first, act like a soldier. Now, second, act like an athlete. Look at verse five. He says, an athlete is not crowned, doesn't get the reward unless he competes according to the rules. Imagine that you, uh, instead of wanting to be a person in the military, you say, I'm gonna be an Olympian. I'm gonna go to the Olympics, okay? It's interesting, actually, this week I found out that there's a golfer in Korea that um, if, he, <laughs> if he wins a medal, in the Olympics, in golf, he doesn't have to do his military service. But if he doesn't, then he has to go into a two-year military thing. So that golf tournament is really important, by the way, uh, this summer, I guess, because there's a guy who's either going to go to the military or not because uh, he wins an Olympic medal. If he doesn't win an Olympic medal, he has to go serve in the military for two years and put his whole career on pause. It says an athlete is not crowned unless they compete according to the rules. You're not going to get the reward. You're not going to get the gold medal or the silver medal if you cheat. If you found out cheating, that prize gets taken away from you. Paul's saying, same thing with, with this crown, same thing with this job that we have to do. You need to think of yourself like an athlete. What do athletes do? They train, they prepare, they get ready to suffer, just like a soldier does. He says, that's what you need to do. If you're going to be a good, godly servant of Christ in the world, that's what you need to do. Verse number six, another illustration. He says, it's a hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. It's a hardworking farmer, right? Not the lazy farmer, right? Proverbs 24 talks about a lazy sluggard who doesn't even take care of his own house and take care of his own yard. But he says, no, no, if you are a hardworking farmer, you're going to 
be motivated by the crops that you're going to bear. That's going to be the thing that gets you up in the morning. That's going to be the thing that gets you going and getting you outside and working. Verse number seven, he says, think over what I say. Think over these illustrations. For the Lord will give you understanding in everything. I think it's interesting. We're looking at a, uh, a passage here tonight that does not explain itself. Do you see that? It's illustration. He's saying, it's, it's like this, it's like this, it's like this. And then at the end, he says, think about this. Dwell on this. If you're ever gonna be a good soldier, a good athlete, or a good farmer, so to speak, for God, what you're gonna have to do is constantly be thinking about these things. Basically, here's the point. You and I, especially as we move up, especially as you're gonna move up from seventh grade to eighth grade, or from eighth grade to ninth grade, you need to get serious about your responsibilities. You need to get serious, not just about your responsibilities at school and with sports. Those are important. But what I want you to think about tonight in particular is your responsibilities as a follower of Christ. Think of yourself like a soldier. Think of yourself like an athlete, not just any athlete, but an Olympian athlete. Think of yourself like a hardworking farmer. That, that's what we're going to learn here tonight. What does it mean to move up? What does it mean to take seriously our responsibilities? The first thing is just be like a soldier. It's interesting because so far, what responsibilities have we talked about? We haven't talked about any of the responsibilities of a Christian. But right here at the beginning, in verse 3, Paul says, one of the first responsibilities of every Christian is to share in suffering. To share in suffering. What does that look like? Well, what it looks like is, if you're a Christian, it looks like you getting ready to suffer for Jesus Christ. That's what it looks like getting ready to do anything for Christ in this world, whether that's obeying your parents, whether that's putting God first instead of the things you want to do first, whether that's being bold to share the gospel and having friends say, I don't want to be with you anymore. Whatever it looks like, Paul says to Timothy, and I'm saying to you, you need to, point number one, get ready to suffer like a courageous soldier. Get ready to suffer like a courageous soldier. I want you to think about that. This week I had a, a meal, I talked to a guy who was an officer in the Marines. I was asking him, what is it like? What is it like to join? What is it like with the guys that you deal with? And I, I was talking to him, I said, I bet it's really hard. I bet it's terrible. I bet like, oh, like nobody could do it. And he looked at me kind of funny. He smiled. He's like, yeah, it's hard, but you can do it. It's hard, but anyone can do it if they set their mind to it. It's not like it's too hard for anybody. It's hard only if you're going to be weak in your mind. It's, it's hard only if you're going to want to give up. Paul says that we are in a war. Imagine if there's a war going on that your country's in and you need to help and you're a soldier and you have to help. Right? For us, it's hard for us to get our minds into that because... You've never really been alive at a time where there's a war where people are attacking us, right? You just, we don't know what it feels like. We, we don't have that sense. And it's a good thing we don't have that sense. It's good that nobody's necessarily attacking us. But the Bible says that there is a war going on that every single Christian, whether you're a baby Christian or you've been a Christian for a while, or whatever you are, there's a battle that's going on. In Ephesians chapter six, Paul says that there's a spiritual battle that's going on. Spiritual battle against the world, in the world, against other people, and also a spiritual battle that's attacking even our own hearts. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 says that we should be strong in the Lord, in the strength of his might. It says, put on the whole armor of God. You've heard that passage before. The idea of getting ready for a fight. What fight are we getting ready for? That you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. We have a spiritual enemy who wants to take people down. It says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. I'm not saying you need to get ready and get super buff so that you can go fight people, right? That's not the war that we're entering. If you're a Christian, you are entering a war though. And the war is against these rulers and authorities and cosmic powers over this present darkness. Against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. It says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand firm, Okay. I just want you to get yourself in the mindset that you are a soldier. Think about it. You're a soldier. If you're a soldier, really, in a real war, okay, he doesn't say we're in a figurative war. He says you're in a spiritual war. 
That does not mean the war is not real. It just means it's not out in the open. It's not this out in front of you. There's swords and, and, there's, and there's a bunch of battleships. And it's not like that. That's not the war that you're in. You're in a different war, but you are in one. And it's just as equally real. Be bold to fight this war. If you actually look at ahead in the passage, you're in 2 Timothy 2. Just look one chapter to the left. 2 Timothy 1. Look at verse 8. He says something similar. He says, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. Don't be ashamed about the gospel. Wonder if that describes you. Are you a person who's ashamed of the gospel? Are you ashamed to wear the name tag Christian? Are you ashamed to wear a shirt that has our church name on it? Are you ashamed to tell people that you stand with Christ? Are you ashamed to tell people that you want to impress that, yeah, I'm actually a Christian? Are you ashamed to be associated with other Christians who you might think are lame? Are you ashamed of the testimony of Christ? He says, I'm not ashamed. He says, don't be ashamed of the testimony. And also, Timothy, don't be ashamed of me, God's prisoner. He says, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. So, so it's interesting. He says, I'm a prisoner and I'm suffering. And don't be ashamed of me. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't be ashamed of any of that. But remember something that God saved us. Look at verse nine. God saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works done by us, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. He said, here's why you shouldn't be ashamed. Because if you're a Christian, you're a part of something that God planned before the world ever started. Not only are you a part of a war that was planned before the world ever started, but you're on the winning side. And you're going to be part of the victory of this war, this spiritual war. Verse number 10 is in now, which has been made manifest through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. Think about that. You're part of a war and you've got a captain who's not only strong, who's not only mighty, who's not only smart, but he's a captain who's actually destroyed death in all of its power. That's the, that's the side that you're on. That's why Paul's like amping Timothy up. Get ready for this fight. Get ready for this fight. We need to have more courage than we do. We're gonna look at a passage in small groups, Colossians 1.24, which says, Paul rejoices in his own suffering for Christ. He was put in jail. He was, a lot of bad things were said about him, but he said he rejoiced in that. Because he's fulfilling and he's filling up in himself what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of the church, which sounds weird, but here's what he's saying. It's like Christ suffered on the cross for us and there's more suffering that needs to be done for Christ and you're going to be the one to do it and I'm going to be the one to do it. Now, it's not the same kind of suffering that Jesus suffered. He suffered to take away our sins. That's not what Paul's talking about here. He's just saying there's suffering that needs to happen for Christ and you're going to be the one that's going to suffer. Are you ready for that? Are you okay with that? Right? Which is why, by the way, becoming a Christian and living for Christ is not as simple as just saying a prayer. It's not as simple as just uh, asking Jesus in your heart. That's, that's not what this is. This is becoming a soldier. Like if you realize that, and for some of you, um, maybe you're scared to join this battle. Maybe that's one of the reasons you don't want to turn to Christ and be a part of his army because you're afraid of the fight. Problem is, you're not fighting with Jesus. You're going to be fought against by Jesus. Get ready to suffer like a courageous soldier. He says, what else do soldiers do? Look at back in verse four. It says, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits. Okay. Um, you and I are entangled. And even that word entangled, doesn't, it's not passive. It's, it's the middle voice, which means that you're entangling yourself. Don't entangle yourself in civilian pursuits. Hey, what's a civilian pursuit? Like I talked about before, starting a business, right? Um, running a, a, a bunch of uh, sports teams, or I don't know. Like if, if you're in the military and you're in the army and you need to be serving in the army, it's probably not a good idea to start a bunch of uh, side projects like uh, basket weaving and uh, selling stuff on Etsy, right? Like, I don't know. Um, do you guys know what Etsy is? Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, the guys are pretty strong on that, yeah, too. Um, 
It's probably not a good idea to start doing that if like you're in a war, right? Imagine you're in some bunker, you know, halfway across the world, and you're like, oh no, I'm making a bunch of uh, baskets for my Etsy shop. It's like you're probably, your focus is probably not in the right place, right? Because you need to be doing something else at this point. You need to be ready to fight. And that's what he's saying. Don't entangle yourself in civilian pursuits, okay? I, I just need you to know, the context of all this is it's a pastor talking to another pastor, okay? So there is something to this that's about if you're serving in ministry, you can't get distracted from the ministry you're supposed to serve in, okay? And for you, you might say, well, I don't know what that is right now, okay? I want you to figure out what that is. That's part of understanding this passage. What does it look like for me to serve Christ? What does it look like for me to serve Christ at home? What does it look like for me to serve Christ at school, to serve him at church, right? You're not too young to be serving at church, right? Every single one of you, um, if you go to this church, I uh, would love for you to be sitting in the main service on Sunday morning or Saturday night. And if you can't, I'd love for you to be serving somewhere on the weekend or somewhere, maybe on Thursday night at Awana. I'd love for you to serve, right? That's what God would want us to do, right? We want to serve the body, okay? That's why you're, one of the reasons your leaders are here. They're serving God by serving you. So, you need to identify what does it look like for me to serve, first of all. But then, once you figure that out, what he says here is don't get distracted from serving. Don't get distracted. If there's something that's going to come up that's going to keep you from serving, serve. And don't worry about that other thing. Don't get entangled with civilian pursuits. Point number two, limit distractions like a focused soldier. Limit distractions like a focused soldier. Think of limiting distractions, being focused. First thing that I think about, one word, compound word. Two words, depending on how you spell it. Homework, okay? You know what I'm talking about. Homework. Has your mom ever said, hey, stop being distracted? Has she ever said that to you? Yeah. My mom said that to me a lot, okay? Distracted was actually a word I, I learned when I was super young. Because my mom liked to say, John, you get distracted. I was just talking to someone today. Sometimes I walk into rooms and forget why I walked in. Does that ever happen to you? Like you're at home, you walk into another room, it's like, wait, why? Did I, why did I do? And then you go back to the room that you're in, like, oh, what was I supposed to get? Oh, oh, okay. And then you go back and you forget it again. Does that ever happen to anybody? That happens to me, okay? We're distractible, right? <laughs> Some say, because you're in junior high, you're the most distractible people on the planet. I don't know if that's true. I think your sixth grade brothers and sisters are more distractible than you. One time I taught at Sparks. They were really distractible. I had to like, so you just got your eyes, right? Um, anyway, but distractions. You think of homework, okay? If you wanted to complete your homework as fast as you can, you know what you probably shouldn't do? You probably shouldn't play video games at the same time as doing your homework, okay? Probably is not a good idea. If your goal is, yeah, see, they're all upset about that. I just made them all mad. Ladies, if you want to get your math homework done, you know what you should, probably shouldn't be doing at the same time? You probably shouldn't be on Pinterest at the same time, okay? You probably shouldn't be on scrolling. You hear these self-righteous guys? They just, they're lobbing it back and forth. You probably shouldn't go outside if what you need to do is read, unless you're reading outside, unless you're reading outside. I got you, I got you, I know. What you probably shouldn't do if you want to finish your, uh, your English homework, your reading and writing, is you probably shouldn't watch TV because it's hard to write while not looking at the page, right? You ever tried that? It's not, it's not usually good, okay? Because if your goal is you have a job to do and you need to finish this right now, okay? If it's urgent, you know how to push out distractions. You've all done it before, okay? Or hopefully, and maybe you have a lot of missing assignments if you don't, okay? But you know how to push out distractions. You know how to get a job done, He's saying something similar here. If you have distractions that keep you from doing what God wants you to do, you need to get rid of those distractions or at least limit them and push them aside when you need to do what you need to do. It's a lot like when you're serving at LIT and at Awana, um, what you shouldn't be doing is talking to all your friends the whole time. You shouldn't be doing that, right? That's a distraction. Your friends, even at that point, are a distraction to you. If what you need to be doing is serving that group of sparks, you know what you need to be doing? Serving that group of sparks, not talking to your friends, okay? If you serve on the game square as an LIT, okay? You know what you shouldn't be doing is just hanging out with all your friends when what you need to be doing is doing the work, setting up, tearing down, helping them out. 
If you serve maybe with a friend, maybe in the three-year-old classroom or the, the first grade classroom, it's okay to talk to your friend as long as that's okay because there are things that you need to do. There's snacks that you need to set out. There, there's kids that need to have your attention, okay? Put your attention in the right place is basically what Paul's saying here. Limit those distractions. Hebrews chapter 12 actually goes further. It doesn't just say put away distractions. It's, it says, it's, imagine that you're running and you've got weights in a backpack with textbooks. Remember those? Um, on your backpack. You need to take any kind of weight off of you as you're running forward. Right? You, know, you know what I've never seen a runner wear? Never seen a runner like on the Olympics or you know, something like that. I've never seen them wear a backpack. Okay? And if they do, it's one of those little camelback things with water in it. You know what I'm talking about? Um, unless they're training, right? But, but you don't really want to have that much weighing you down. And here's what the author of Hebrews says. He says, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that's set before us. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Here's the deal. If you're going to serve Christ rightly, and if you're going to move up, you need to do two things, okay? You need to cast off sins, get rid of some sins that are clinging closely to you, that are keeping you from doing what you need to do. Sins like selfishness, sins like always putting yourself first, sins like dishonesty, not telling your parents the full truth. You need to toss those aside. Sins like coveting, seeing what other people have or seeing what they look like and wanting all of that, envious in your heart. You need to put off sins like complaining when you don't like how things work out. You need to put off sins like lust. You put off sins like anger. You need to put off sins like pride. You need to put off those types of things because they're keeping you from doing what God wants you to do and they're wrong. But he doesn't just say sins. He says every weight, every distraction. That means for some of us, that means we need to limit distractions. That means we need to limit, when God wants us to do something, we need to make sure we're doing it. When God wants you to read the Bible, a lot of the time I hear people say, I don't have time to read the Bible, okay? But if we look at how much time you spend on social media or how much time you spent watching TV or watching YouTube, right? Okay, we have time to read the Bible, which means for you, if you're not reading the Bible, you're not talking to God, you need to cast off those distractions in the morning if it's social media, if it's TV, if it's video games, things that keep you from doing what God wants you to do, you need to put those off because you're a soldier and it's, it's welcome to wartime. Sometimes you even need to put off good things, even good things. If serving God, let's give that example. Go back to being an LIT. Go back to the game circle, okay? You can have your friends there and that, those are good friends. You can say, well, they're good friends. I'm fellowshipping, right? Okay, well, if you've got a job to do, and you need to be serving the kids, you need to be helping them out with games or whatever, you need to cast off even a good thing, like your friends, and saying, I, I need to focus on this right now. Sometimes what that means is we need to be less involved with all of our mind and all of our attention in our sports or in our music. If we really can't serve God, if we really are not able to do both, what has to give first? The Bible says what has to to give first is, is your music, is your sports, not God, not serving. I think the easiest one for us to let get in the way of serving God or even doing what God wants us to do, the easiest one is, uh, is sleep. Okay, that's a good thing. I think sleep's a good thing. But you know that probably the first step to doing any of this is probably putting off some sleep, waking up a little earlier, maybe going to bed a little bit earlier, right? whatever it is. It could be good things, the author of Hebrews says, but cast off every weight that keeps you from serving Christ the way you need to. That's thinking like a soldier, okay? There's two more illustrations he gives. He says, think like an athlete, like a runner. Okay, he's not crowned unless he competes according to the rules, okay? If you're cutting corners in this race, if you're not obeying the rules of the race, you're not gonna be crowned. You're not gonna be, honored by God for, for doing the things you need to be doing. Point number three, don't cut corners as an honest athlete. Okay, if you're an honest athlete, honest athletes do not cut corners. They don't get around the rules. Don't you hate it when you're playing 
any kind of sport and people cheat. Doesn't it make you mad, right? When they cheat, what about when they get away with it? That's the worst, isn't it? When people cheat and they get away with it. You know, I think the biggest reason why people cheat, biggest reason is they don't put in the work, right? People cheat. I could be a faster runner than Chris Francisco if I just cheated, right? It's not that hard. Just cheat, right? Be better at uh, basketball than LeBron James if I just had special access to a ladder by the rim every time, right? Whatever. Oh, it's cheating. Oh, I forgot. Can't do that, right? To serve God with your life, cheating can't be involved. But I think what he's getting at here is when you don't follow the rules and you don't cut corners, the reason is because you don't want to put in the work, right? As an athlete, if you were going to really prepare as an athlete, you say, I need to put in the work. I need to work hard for this. In the first book to Timothy, the first letter that Paul wrote to Timothy, he says this in 1 Timothy 4, 7. It says, have nothing to do with silly myths, things that are irreverent like that. It says, rather train yourself for godliness. Get ready, train yourself for that. Go the extra mile. Verse eight says, for while bodily training is of some value, right? That's why working out, doing sports, it's good. It is of some value. But it says godliness is of value in every way. It's better because it holds promise for the present life and the life to come. It's better to do that. Reading your Bible is going to take work if you're going to do it every day. If you're really going to focus and you're really going to try to learn from it and glean what God wants, that's going to take work. It's going to feel like the work of an athlete. If you're really going to give yourself to prayer like you should and praying intensely to God and asking him for things, you know what that's going to take? That's going to take work like an athlete. If you do the hard work of showing love to other people when you don't feel like it, you know what it's going to feel like sometimes? It's going to feel like training. It's going to feel like work. If you're going to be constant at serving at church and going the extra mile and trying to help people and trying to pick up trash and trying to serve people, you know what it's going to look like? It's going to feel and look like work because it is. That's what he's preparing Timothy for. That's what I want to prepare you for. 1 Corinthians 9, we're going to look at in small groups. Paul says that same illustration of the running. He says, imagine you're a runner and you're running in a race. He says, only one receives the prize. So run like you may obtain it. Run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. You're not eating certain things. You're eating stuff that tastes bad and you're working out. Why? Because you do it to gain some type of prize, some type of perishable crown. But we, as we train for godliness, you know what we're doing? We're, We're doing it to gain eternal rewards. I don't run aimlessly. I don't box as one hitting the air but I discipline my body and keep it under control. And that's a key to being a good athlete for Christ. That's the key to not cutting corners is self-control, discipline. You feel how this feels kind of like the coach, right? Even this message feels like my coach when I was 11, you know, screaming at me, right? Uh, Because it's hard, right? But you need to be warned. You need to be aware. This is what it's going to take to step up. This is what it's going to take to grow. He says, I don't want to be disqualified after preaching. That's what 1 Corinthians 9, 27 says. Because I need to keep myself under control lest after I go preach and tell people how to come to Jesus that I act like I don't know him. Same thing's true for you. Says, don't disqualify yourself. Don't cut corners. Don't fall into sin. The same sin that you'd call out and tell people is sin and you need to repent of. Don't you fall into that too? Right after you've just told someone how to get saved, right after you tell someone that they need to trust Christ. And then, then don't disqualify yourself from doing that by, by not doing it yourself. Don't do that. One more image, the hardworking farmer. What does that look like? He says the hardworking farmer ought to have the first share of the crops. Think what he's talking about there is rewards. He's saying, think of yourself like a soldier. That means be strong. It means be courageous. It means be single-minded, focused. He says be an athlete, follow the rules, be honest. Then he says, Be like a farmer who's waiting for the rewards. Be patient. That's point number four. Be motivated by rewards like a patient farmer. Okay, if you're gonna take your responsibilities in Christ seriously, what it's gonna look like is you being patient. But also as we're patient, what's gonna keep you patient? Well, motivation. That reward is coming. 
It's kind of like uh, everything you buy on Amazon. You buy things on Amazon? I buy things on Amazon. Darcy buys things on Amazon. You know why? It's because Darcy has Amazon Prime. John has Amazon Prime. Alexandra uses my Amazon Prime. Alexandra occasionally buys things on Amazon Prime. My card. And then sometimes, sometimes I buy things and put her name on it just to trick her. Sometimes. All the time. Whenever I send it to the house, you know why? Because on my Amazon, it's the first thing that says send to my house. It's her name. So I'm like, ah, oh, whatever. Let's send it to her name. Whatever. It doesn't matter. But the thing about Amazon is it, you like how it, if you have the app, it tells you where the, the package is. It says 10 stops away, six stops away, four stops away. It's like very up to date. It's cool. And I can wait. And I'm waiting there. Like I bought a, what's something dumb? I bought a mouse. Um, not a mouse. Sorry, that sounded weird. Not a, not a, animal with a tail, but a thing for your computer, okay? Um, and I was waiting for it today. I was like, where? Oh, 10 stops, six stops, four stops. I was motivated. And then I ran downstairs and said, Brianna, where's the package? Where's, and then, then it, it was in my folder already. But I, I get motivated because I'm like, it's coming. Reward is coming. It's, it, whatever I'm looking forward to, it's coming, okay? The problem is when we think about the rewards that God has for us, there's not that like tracking number of 10 stops away, six stops away. But you need to trust that it is coming if you're going to serve Christ. There are rewards coming. How can you be motivated constantly? Right? How can you keep doing the work that you need to do, expecting reward to come? Well, part of it is verse 7. Think about these things. Think over what I said. Really consider it. Think about it often. There's a time when Jesus told someone in the gospels, he says, you need to sell everything you have. Give it up and follow me. And the guy said, no. And right after that, the disciples looked at Jesus and said, Jesus, don't you like how we gave up everything? We sold everything. We left our boats behind. We left all this stuff behind. What do you think Jesus said to them? He said, stop. Stop being dumb, right? That's not, that's not what Jesus says. Jesus actually said this in Matthew 19, 29. He says, everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake. If you leave stuff behind and really suffer for me, he says that person will receive 100 fold, 100 times as much and will inherit eternal life. Because even in this life, there are rewards, which I think is why Paul's getting at in this passage, people who do the work of ministry, we want them to see the fruit of their ministry. He says, you're going to see fruit. You're going to see God bear fruit in your life. If you're constant in Bible reading, you're constant in prayer, you know what you're going to see? You're going to be like a hardworking farmer that sees God bear fruit in your life. You're going to see the fruit of the Spirit in your life like you never have before. If you really work to serve people like in Awana, or, or like on the weekend services. You know what you're going to start to see if you're constant in that? You're going to start to see fruit. And the point is, there's this idea of, is the fruit now or is the fruit later? And a lot of people disagree. I think really, the reality is, in all of scripture, we see that there's fruit and there's rewards in both. There's rewards now and there's rewards later. Just like some of those rewards I mentioned, we get them now in this life. We see the fruit of the Spirit in our life. But also there's rewards behind all of this, in front of all this, really, in the next life. That's why at the end of his life, the end of the letter, if you're in 1 Timothy 2, look at 1 Timothy 4. 1 Timothy 4, verse 8. Verse 7, let's start there. Let's start in verse 6, actually. <laughs> why not? Um, verse 6, it says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. That's really figurative language for saying, I'm, I'm about to give my life for Christ. I'm about to die. He was in prison at this point. Seems like he'd have his head cut off pretty soon for Christ. And he says, I'm, it's like I'm already being poured out. It's like my life is already being given. That's what it feels like. He says, verse seven, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge will award me on that day. And you think, well, that, that's really cool. I mean, Paul, he kind of worked harder. He was an apostle. He wrote the Bible. He like preached all the time. Well, I guess for him, there's a reward. Look at what it says next. And not only to me. 
So apparently there's this crown, there's this reward that's going to happen, but not only to Paul, but also to all. See where it says all? All who loved his appearing. All who are waiting for Jesus to come back. All who are serving him. It's true about finishing a race. It doesn't really matter where you start. It really matters how you finish. It doesn't really matter all of what happens in the course of the race, as long as you didn't cheat, of course. <laughs> that matters. Um, but if you're serving honestly and doing the right thing, it really matters how you finish. That's what Paul says. It matters how you finish. And he's about to finish. Timothy, it seems like, is just getting started. Right? And for you, that's probably how it feels. You're just getting started. You might think, well, my life, I got my whole life ahead of me. Exactly. That's why we're talking about this right now. Exactly. You got all high school in front of you. Yes, exactly. That's why we're talking about this. Because you need to think, I am a soldier for Christ. I am an athlete for Christ. I'm a farmer for Christ. And I'm going to be strong. I'm going to be single-minded. I'm going to be honest. And I'm going to be patient in serving Christ. We're going to talk about that in small groups. We're going to look at some of these questions as we wrap up and have only a couple more small groups with these groups. I want us to think about how we can honestly start serving Christ the way we need to. So let's pray about that right now.